Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, it's me and all of my friends. In all seriousness, we've got back from Friedrichshafen from Eurobike, but John is currently busy building a special bike for an up and coming video, so stay tuned for that. This week on the show, we look at how much faster a TT bike is than a road bike. We also have the Bike Vault, your upgrades, much more, and snacks of the week. This week, we're looking at how much faster a time trial bike setup is than a road bike setup. And what got me thinking about this was the Ironman 70.3 champs in Nice last weekend. I know it's a triathlon, but bear with me. Now that race was won by Norway's Gustav Eden, who beat Alistair Brownlee from Yorkshire, that's where I'm from, if you didn't know, uh, who came second. Now this was all the more impressive because Eden rode the 90 kilometer bike leg on a road bike, which compared to the rest of his competitors who were all on time trial bikes. Some caveats though, the bike course in Nice wasn't flat. It featured a massive climb in the form of the category one Col de Vence and also a technical descent. And this means that a more aerodynamic but heavier and arguably less maneuverable time trial bikes advantages are lessened against a road bike. And also the road bike Eden was using was an S-Works Venge, which is about as aerodynamic as road bikes get. The likelihood is that Eden would have won by an even bigger margin had he used a TT bike. He even said in a post-race interview that his choice of bike was down to the fact that he currently didn't have a time trial bike. And he reckoned that a time trial bike would have been faster on that course. Now that said, the differences between the two are intriguing. And we often hear wattage savings and drag savings quoted from wind tunnels and by computer modeling, but I decided to do some real life testing myself to see what the differences would be, as this is far less frequently done. Now I too don't currently have a time trial bike. But there is a course in Wales that I've ridden a time trial bike on many times in the past. So I decided to go over with my road bike and see what I could do as a comparison. Now, for my time trial bike setup that I'd used in the past, I used a Canyon Speedmax TT bike with the Triathlon water bottle fitted at the front. Not UCR legal, but it is faster on the bike. And also a Zip Sub 9 rear disc and a Zip 808 front wheel. And onto those were Continental GP TT tires. I also had a Bell Javelin helmet and a skin suit. The course is 25 miles or 40 kilometers. And using that setup, my times ranged from 51.45 to 49 minutes. And this variation was largely down to weather conditions on the day. So the 51.45 was a really slow crap day with loads of wind and rain, and it was really cold. Now, my road setup that I wanted to compare against was my Pinarello Dogma F12. And onto that, I had Vision Metron 40C wheels, so 40 millimeters deep two 500 uh, milliliter water bottles. I was also using a Bell uh, Zero road helmet and a skin suit. I was also using Continental GP5000 tubeless tires. Now, I could have used deeper wheels. I could have used the time trial helmet and I could have used, well, tri bars, but I deliberately didn't. I didn't want to because I wanted to use a setup that would be the same as if I was competing in a road race as a comparison. Now, I tried to be as aerodynamic as possible on the road bike. I was riding in an aero position on the hoods with my elbows bent. And when my arms got a bit tired doing that, I'd momentarily switch to the drops to get a bit of a rest and then back again. And using this setup, I achieved a time of 55.45, which was for roughly the same power as what I'd done on the TT bike, so about 290 watts. In terms of conditions, it was a decent day. There wasn't much wind, it was pretty still. It was quite cold, around 12 degrees though, and the air density was quite high, which slows you down a bit. Now, the conditions were decent, so I would say, based on my experience of riding that on a time trial bike, I think had I been on that time trial setup, it would have equated to a 50 something sort of time. And so for the sake of argument, I believe that the difference between the two for the same power is about five minutes, which feels like a lot. I should point out though, that that time saving equates specifically to me 
on that specific course. On different courses, it would be different. On a hillier, slower course, you'd expect the difference between a road bike and a time trial bike to be less, but I still think it's pretty interesting. And the other thing that's really important to point out is that using a full time trial bike doesn't guarantee you savings like that. Uh, a few years prior to that, I'd used a different time trial setup that was nowhere near as optimized. One of my friends had lent me his TT bike and I had a skin suit and a time trial helmet and I decided to just rock up and have a go. And the time I achieved, roughly for the same power again, was 54.16, just over a minute quicker than the road setup I used this time. And that goes to show that the biggest differences that you can gain from a time trial bike and that kind of setup is sorting out your position and your head position and learning to get as aero as possible on that kind of bike. So if you ever wondered, there you go. And I'm not for one moment suggesting that you need to go and buy all the expensive fancy time trial kit in order to go five minutes quicker. Personally, I enjoy doing a time trial on a road bike as much as I do on a time trial bike. I think you just get satisfaction from pushing yourself as hard as you can go and you just adjust the goalposts. I mean, if you went on a recumbent, you'd probably do it in 30 minutes. So it doesn't really matter. It's just more about that self-satisfaction. But let me know what you think in the comments section. What's your experience of riding uh, a sort of aero optimized setup and a standard setup? What's the sort of differences you've encountered? Hot tech now, and last week, myself and John were at Eurobike, teched up to our eyeballs. There was loads of stuff and we made quite a lot of videos. So if you wanna see the latest things, then make sure you check those out. One of the things we saw was Zwift's preview of the new Harrogate World Championships course, the 14 kilometer finishing circuit. Now, at the time of the tech show going out, that's now available to ride, so that's pretty exciting. I'm gonna be going having a go on that. Something we missed at Eurobike that was launched there was a new Brompton gravel bike. Yep, if you've ever wanted a Brompton that can go off-road, then the Brompton Explore is for you. It features easier gear ratios than your standard Brompton, Schwalbe Marathon tires, a repairs pouch with spare spokes and brakes, amongst other things, and a big 28-litre bag at the front for your sandwiches. I have to say though, the forest green colorway does look really cool. The 20th Human Powered Speed Challenge is currently taking place in Battle Mountain, Nevada in the United States. And this is where teams from around the world aim to break land speed cycling records that are unassisted. That means no towing, no drafting, just human power and lots of space age tech. My friend Ken Buckley is actually taking part, so I got him to send some information and some pictures about the bike that he's piloting. It's the University of Liverpool's Velocipede. It's called the Ariane 5, and it's a tricycle-style three-wheel uh, recumbent with an aerodynamic fairing over the top. The fairing that covers the bike is a full carbon fiber shell, and this was designed using CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and molded by the students at the University of Liverpool. Now the drag coefficient of this particular velocipede is said to be incredibly low, roughly a tenth of that of what you'd get for a world-class time trialist and their bike, which is, well, mind-boggling. It means that you can go a lot faster for the same amount of power. Now, in terms of braking systems, you've got disc brakes and rim brakes on the bike, which are necessary to slow it down if it goes over 80 miles per hour, which is roughly what the target is. And there's also an SRM power meter for power measurement. You may have noticed that absolutely monster chainring at the front of the bike. That is a 92 tooth front chainring, absolutely bonkers. The drivetrain is very specialist for the demands of the event and it's paired to Shimano XTR components with some custom ratios. And you may also be thinking, when the fairing's on, where are the windows? Well, there aren't any. Get this, there's a small camera that's fitted to the bike and the pilot, which is either Ken Buckley or Yasmin Tradle in the women's event, see by way of two five-inch screens fitted to the inside of the bike. It's kind of like, well, like a submarine or something. <laughs> 
Ken tells me that in order to try and break the land speed record, he'll aim to do 400 watts for five minutes in a run, followed by one minute at 600 watts, which sounds well, pretty bonkers to me. But all the best to uh, the team from the University of Liverpool and all the other teams competing in this brilliant event. I've always wanted to go out there and check it out. Maybe, maybe next year we'll make it out. Snacks of the week now. I know, I can't believe this actually worked either. But we've been sent more snacks. Check this out. Now, Stu Tomlinson from Wilmslow in Greater Manchester has sent us some Loka chocolate wafers. He says these are relevant as they were an in-flight snack provided to him on his flight back from the, and I quote, superb GCN Salback event. Please share with anyone involved with GCN events and John as a consolation for missing out. See you at the next one. Well, thanks, Stu. Fortunately, John's not here, so I guess I'll just have to uh, eat more myself. Anyway, submit your snacks using the uploader tool below. Actually, no, don't do that. Just put them in the post. <laughs> Cha-ching! It's now time for screw riding upgrades by Upgrades, where you submit pictures, videos, animations, clay models, sketches, evidence of the upgrades that you've made to your bikes or equipment for a chance to win the ultimate prize, a GCN Camelback Eddy water bottle. Now, last week was Matt from Leicestershire up against Ander from Vitoria in Spain with his 96 Megamo. Matt's bike was painted by Dr. Bobby at uh, Colourburn Studios, who we went to see. And the winner was Matt's Principia, with 76% of the vote. What bottles in the post, uh, Matt? Now, to submit yours, you can simply use the uploader tool below. Now, this week, we have Stephen from Calgary in Alberta, Canada, with his Bianchi Ocelot. Check this out. Now, Stephen wanted an all-road bike but his budget wouldn't allow for a shiny new 700C gravel bike with disc brakes. So he was inspired by John's garbage to gravel series and he set about building one from an upcycled old mountain bike frame. He acquired his Bianchi Ocelot frame in classified ads and then added a 8x3 Shimano drivetrain, some modern V brakes, a reasonable lightweight 26 inch wheel set, drop bars, seven speed bar end shifters, which took a lot of encouragement to pair with the eight speed cassette, and the cherry on top, which was a very unique three by race face crank set with gold accents. He also reconditioned the headset and bottom bracket and finished it off with some gum wall tires. I mean, look at that. That's what he started off with, the old tired ocelot frame. There's all his, his kit, all his bits that he's put on it. Wowzers. I think that looks absolutely mega. It's a very nice forest as well. That's almost bike vault worthy. You put that there, but that, you've done a cracking job with that. I have to say, Stephen's bike looks, well, rather splendid and the forests of Calgary also look amazing. I'd quite like to visit. Now up against Stephen this week is Micah from Brighton in the UK with his old pointer 531 steel lugged frame, which he bought as a commuter bike while studying for his master's degree. Now, he says it was in a sorry state with four coats of badly done paint, a broken front shifter, mismatched wheels, and various other mechanical problems. Now, he stripped the frame with some dichloromethane, which incidentally is my favorite protic solvent. Uh, although it is wrongly loathed by many process chemists the world over, but that's another story for GCN Tech after dark. Anyway, Mike uh, resprayed the frame with four coats of gold flake clear coat and chucked on a SRAM red 10 speed group set. The wheels were built by a local wheel builder, DCR, to mimic the old Shamals, but with modern tech. And since he's on a student budget, the rest of part the rest of the bike is parts he had lying around or he bought ultra cheap on eBay. The total cost of this build, right? 570 pounds. And it only weighs 7.1 kilos. That is brilliant. So there it was before. And then look at it now. Wowzers, gold chain as well. No, he's not here. And, oh, nice uh, speed play pedals. Nice Physique 00 saddle on there as well. That's like what I use. I really like that. That's mega. And he's gonna use it in the uh, Yorkshire World Championships Sportive too. 
brilliant. That's a mega bike and imp impressive for the uh, budget you did it on. It shows what can be achieved. I'll tell you what, it's a tough one this week. I wouldn't like to pick between either of them. Both are excellent submissions, but I don't have to pick. It's down to you guys. So you can click on the survey up here and let us know which you think is the best upgrade. It's time now for the Bike Vault, where you submit pictures using the uploader down below of your bikes, and we judge them to be nice or super nice. None of this splendid malarkey that happened last week. Anyway, if they're super nice, then John rings the bell. John's not here this week, which means I will try and ring the bell. Okay, let's get started. Right, first up we have Eric with his 3T Strada Pro and his location is Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in the most inter Instagram spot. Look at that, that's a rather nice bike, isn't it? Look at that. Wow, that's a very nice paint job. He's got on there, nice uh, quark power meter. He, uh, he hasn't quite aligned up his wheels though. Um, yeah, and I think I mean, he's, oh, is he in the... It doesn't look like he's quite in the 10 tooth sprocket either. It's not quite Biggie Smalls. Um, nice. That's a nice bike, uh, Eric. Nice 3T Strada Pro. Next, Timothy. Timothy is in Sussex County, New Jersey. And he has his 94 Colnago Superissimo frame and fork and his first year Campi Ergo Power Group. Oh, look at that. That is a beautiful bike. Although I have to say, oh no, look at those pedals as well, wow. Nice Vittoria Corsa Tamwall tires, modern tires, but they look the part on that older bike. That really is good. He's taken all his bottles off. Oh, he's got Campagnolo Delta brakes on there. That is a very nice bike indeed, loving the red. Loving the, uh, the old group set looks really nice as well with the quill stem. That's a, re that is a, that's a really nice bike. But you've made a bit of an error by taking a picture of it in the long grass. You clearly didn't watch Jurassic Park The Lost World. There could be anything in the long grass. Velociraptors, for example. It's a nice. Right, next uh, is Daniel with his Cannondale Topstone and Daniel's in uh, New York, USA, at a place called Pen Yan. And um, let's have a look at Daniel's bike. There it is, next to the waterfall. I know that Last of the Mohicans was shot in, uh, in North Carolina, but that does remind me of the waterfalls in Last of the Mohicans. That's a very nice spot you've picked. You've lined up the tires, great. Not quite in Biggie Smalls, but we'll let that go because of the kind of weird gravel bike one by thing going on. Your bar tape matches your saddle. You've taken your water bottles out. You've picked a great backdrop. There's some good depth of field there. You've clearly watched the video on how to get in the bike vault. Oh no, oh no. I think we have a cheater. He appears to have uh, done some Photoshop trickery. I don't think that's genuine depth of field we've got there because he seems to have erased his front shifter while smudging the background to make it look like he's got depth of field. Oh dear, oh dear. Trickery of this kind just can't go unpunished. That's a nice. Right, next we have Sammy with his Cinelli Proxima uh, from 2002. The location is the Railway Museum Park in uh, Hyvinka, Finland. Probably not pronounced that correctly. It's got a nice Campagnolo Mirage group set on there. That is an absolute stunner. You don't see many of those. That is a beautiful Cinelli. Really nice. I love the bar tape you've put on there. I'm guessing that's not original, but you've, it just matches the bike perfectly and it's a little bit funky. It's really cool. You've lined up your wheels really well. We're almost in Biggie Smalls. You've got bottles, but they match perfectly with the bike Cinelli bottles. Liking that. Yes, crank in the three o'clock position and really good, genuine depth of field, not fake depth of field done by smudging it in Photoshop. That is, I mean, that is, it's, it's 
it's uh, kind of a um, almost a soup. Oh wait, no, you've used a fire extinguisher to prop up the bike. What if there was a fire in the railway museum? Clearly a massive breach of health and safety, putting other people's lives at risk. This won't be tolerated in the bike vault. That's a nice. Right, next up we have Nando with his B-Twin Ultra 700 AF. Um, and the location is Decathlon Indonesia. Check out that. He's got his B-Twin uh, 700 AF, which is an aluminium bike, and he's put on some custom carbon wheels. That looks really smart, doesn't it? Really nice. Love what you've done. I love the pink bar tape matched with the pink bottle as well. That looks wicked. That's a really smart, and the little pink accent on the seat post collar as well. Little nice touch that. Yeah. I mean, the wheels aren't quite perfectly lined up, but um, I, think that, I think that one's a super nice. Super nice for that one, nice clean background as well. Well done. Now, next we have Russell, who is at Hampton Court Palace in the UK. Let's have a look at Russell's submission. Wow, oh, oh, oh. My goodness, that appears to be a K6 series red telephone box introduced in 1936 to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of King George V. Of course, the iconic red phone box, widely regarded as a design classic, was designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott. The K6 design, again by Scott, was essentially a smaller, more streamlined version of the K2, intended to produce in larger numbers at considerably cheaper cost and to occupy less pavement space. The K6 was eight foot three inches uh, tall and weighed about 0.69 of a ton compared to the K2, which was nine foot three inches and uh, 1.27 tons. So considerably smaller and lighter. Elements of the design were also streamlined and simplified, so the Grecian fluting was removed from the door and window surrounds, and also the separate pediment and uh, frieze were merged into a single piece. The crown motif, which was perforated in the K2 for ventilation, uh, was now an embossed uh, bas relief, and a separate ventilation slot was included on the K6. A new glazing pattern was also introduced into the door. Now that is an absolutely superb foam box design. Absolutely hot, super nice. More Bike Vault next week. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the show and hopefully John will return next week. Now, if you'd like to support the channel and you enjoy what we do, then you can do by subscribing, by clicking down below, and also click the little bell icon too. And if you'd like to get one of these rather splendid slash super nice hoodies like that I'm wearing, well, they're available in the GCN shop. Bye.